the southwest border in Texas is Aloisa Temez. She owns land along the border, and every day to walk onto her land, she has to walk 1,200 feet to the east down a gravel path, and there she arrives at a massive metal fence and a gate. And she has a code, and she taps the code into this pad, and the fence, the gate opens up, and she walks through. Now, why is this? In 2006, Congress passed the Secure Fence Act. It was a bipartisan effort embraced by Democrats and Republicans to secure the southwest border. It allowed the Department of Homeland Security to build 700 miles worth of fencing along the southwest border to halt illegal immigration into the United States. Fast forward to January 2017, and President Trump signs Executive Order 13767, mandating the construction of a massive contiguous wall along the southwest border from California all the way through to Texas. Fast forward again to February 2019. President Trump, unable to get his funding through Congress to build his wall, declares a national emergency, therefore diverting congressional funds that are unauthorized to the military for the military to begin seizing private property and begin building the wall. Now, our country is divided not just by a fence between Mexico and the United States, it's divided by a wall, an ideological wall and a cultural wall. And on one end of the spectrum, we have people who say, build the wall. And the other end of the spectrum, we have people who say, don't build the wall. But, but, at the end of the day, putting politics to the side for one moment, just imagine Aloisa Temez in 2007, the Department of Homeland Security came across her land and they sought to take it to build the fence. But things didn't go too well. Aloisa Temez fought the federal government in federal court for seven years, seven years, litigating, fighting, consulting, trying to keep her property, trying to keep her land. Inevitably, the federal government paid Aloisa Temez $56,000 for a quarter acre of land for that fence to bisect directly through her property. Now, putting politics to the side, imagine Aloisa Temez's turf fight with the federal government happening over and over and over and over and over again, all along the southwest border with thousands of other landowners who are going to fight tooth and nail with the federal government to keep their property. It's going to take time, and there are obstacles and impediments to building a massive wall. So let's talk about the southwest border for a moment. It's 2,000 miles long. Two-thirds of the land is owned by the federal government. The rest of the land is owned by private landowners, Native American tribes, and state and local governments. Just in Texas, there are 5,000 individual parcels owned by individual landowners that would have to be seized. In Arizona, there's 62 miles of land that's occupied by the Tohono O'odham tribe. Just in Texas, there's the Big Bend National Park, which the wall would have to go directly through, and there's also the Rio Grande River, where the wall would literally have to go directly down the river. It's gonna take time. It's gonna take effort, resources, to build this wall. So what's the precedent for building these major federal projects? Well, we gotta take a step back to the 1970s. Big Cypress National Preserve, one of the largest land acquisition projects in American history. There, the Department of Interior had to acquire over 500,000 acres of land in order to preserve that natural mosaic ecosystem. It took the department eight years, eight years altogether, to acquire all the land for this national park. Or how about the Harry S. Truman Dam? in Missouri in the 1970s. Again, a large, major federal project. The Army Corps of Engineers had to gather and acquire thousands of miles of land to build the dam and also to inundate thousands of miles of planes. It took the Army Corps of Engineers 15 years to acquire all the land necessary to build the dam and to inundate all the waters and the planes that were necessary. Now, as a constitutional law professor, I'm oftentimes asked by U.S. senators or reporters from the Washington Post or even my law students in class, Professor, can he do that? Can President Trump seize so much private property to build this wall? Where did the power come from and how did he get it? 
Well, oftentimes the answer to these questions is found buried in thousands of pages of congressional testimony from the 1800s and 1900s. And oftentimes the answer is found directly in the Constitution. So to answer some of these questions, we've got to take a step back to 1789. There, Congress, a gentleman named James Madison, went to the House floor with a litany of amendments and changes to the Constitution which would be known as the Bill of Rights and the first 10 amendments. And smack dab in the middle of those amendments is amendment number five. And at the very end of that amendment, there are 12 words, just 12 words that give the federal government the power to take your private property. Those words state the following, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Now, what does that mean? The Supreme Court has interpreted that to mean the federal government can take your house and your farm and your ranch so long as they do it for a public use, that is, to build a dam or to build a fence, maybe a highway, or perhaps to build a wall. And they got to pay just compensation. That's fair market value of the price of your property at that time. We call this the takings clause. It's called eminent domain condemnation, the power to seize your private property. When was the first time that this power was ever used and exercised? Well, we got to take a step back to 1864. There, amidst the Civil War, Congress was looking for land in Illinois, Rock Island, to build a military arsenal. And they had never used this power before, never had the federal government gone into state lines to seize private property and to use it to build a military arsenal. But Congress tried something different. They wanted to give the Secretary of War the power to go inside Illinois, take the land, and then build the military arsenal. They passed a law which allowed this to happen, but of course laws have to be signed by presidents. And it was this president, Abraham Lincoln, in April of 1864, that signed that bill, the first federal authorization of federal eminent domain. And since then, the federal government has been taking private property for major land acquisition projects since. And what about that National Emergencies Act, the Declaration? Several days before President Trump declared his national emergency, I got a phone call from a reporter at the Washington Post. She asked, can he do that? Can he divert unauthorized congressional funds to the military to build a wall? Is there really an emergency? And the wall wouldn't be built for several years. Well, my job as a law professor is not to give the politically expedient answer. My job is to profess the truth. So I said, uh, I'll get back to you. Uh, and, and I did, and I did. What I did is I combed through thousands and thousands of pages of congressional testimony within a two or three day span of time to find the answer. And amidst that process, I came across a gentleman named Frank Church. He's a senator from Idaho. He's a Democrat. He was the chair, co-chair, of the Special Committee on National Emergencies. He co-chaired that committee with another gentleman named Charles Mathias, who was a senator out of Maryland. He was a Republican. So this is a bipartisan effort between a Republican and a Democrat to figure out ways to constrain future presidents from using this law in ways it wasn't supposed to be used for. At the end of his congressional testimony in 1976, he had, a, he had a statement just towards the end before this law was voted on, and he said the following. A president should not be allowed to invoke emergency authorities or in any way utilize the provision of the National Emergencies Act for frivolous or partisan matters. Now, I got back to the reporter as I found the answer. I wrote up an editorial and I published it in the Washington Post and to inform and educate the American people about why the law was not supposed to be used the way that the president was using it. Now, I raise this because it's very important for us to understand that actions taken by presidents and members of Congress have consequences today and in the future. Oftentimes, when a law is used in a way that defies political conventions, it gives rise to something that we constitutional law scholars call constitutional hardball. That is, that it opens up an opportunity for the next president or the next member of Congress or a political party to retaliate. 
it escalates a situation where the next president may use that same law for a very different reason. Do we want to live in a world when, say, the next Democratic president wants to declare a national emergency over climate change, begins seizing private property to build windmills? And then the tit-for-tat continues, and the next Republican president decides to declare a national emergency over abortion. Or perhaps the tit-for-tat continues, and then the next Democratic president decides to declare a national emergency over gun violence and seizing firearms right, for the health and safety of the people. No, that's not what the law is supposed to be used for, but it sets up this constitutional hardball retaliatory efforts. But we as Americans, uh, we've been through a lot. We are resilient. We have resolve and perseverance, and we've been through a lot. We've overcome a lot of hurdles in difficult times. We've overcome many obstacles. And usually throughout history, we come out a better people at the end of the day. So perhaps it's better said here today that we, as a nation, are greater than the walls that divide us. Thank you.